Thank you for coming. Beautiful day here in Fairbanks. Um, just to kind of get an understanding of the crowd, uh, how many out of you would say you're currently in the energy efficiency or an energy efficiency practitioner at the moment in some form or fashion? So we have a large part of the crowd singing to the choir here. Uh, how many people are in the finance sector? Excellent. We're going to beat up on you a little bit today. Uh, and uh, how about uh, the consult design consultant um, area? Architects, engineers, great. And contractors? Great. Okay, so good, good mix in the room of everybody. Well, I'm going to start uh, the presentation by sort of focusing a bit at, at a bit of a higher level, just sort of setting the stage and uh, for most of you hearing what you already know <laughs> in the sense of the, uh, you know, the big opportunity that's out there. But then uh, I need your help because we're going to walk through a, a bit of an example that we've done. Uh, we're actually uh, executing on a, a project, but sort of walk through you know, some of the challenges that are being faced and, and uh, you know, get a better understanding of why, given there's such a big opportunity, we're not seeing as much activity as, as we'd all like, I think, in the marketplace. Let's see if this thing's going to work for me. There we go. So, um, I wear two hats. Uh, one is I um, am the founder of Windmill Development Group, and we're, uh, as, as per the introduction, we're, we're focused on being a leader in sustainable development, largely in new buildings. So this is one of our projects. It's a uh, carbon neutral community in Victoria, British Columbia. It's about a million three square feet. Um, it has the highest LEED Platinum rating of any uh, buildings in the world. It's uh, LEED Platinum for neighborhood rated. And, you know, we did all this and made as much money as everybody else. If not, we'd like to think we're, we're finding ways to get creative and make more. So we spent a lot of time on trying to figure out the financial hurdles and, and how to work around that to, to do that. But then we've also shifted and uh, created a partnership with a company out of Vancouver called Leadcore Construction. They're one of Canada's largest contractors and really seeing the opportunity in the retrofit market. Uh, in fact, probably the much higher and faster growth market than new construction over the next 15 to 20 years here in North America and uh, put together basically a consortium called Lead Core Renew where we're focused on optimizing existing buildings into deep green uh, retrofits and so not sort of going in and doing 10, 20 percent better but finding ways to get 40, 50 percent better. And part of that is, uh, you know, in, in the whole idea of creating a business case for green buildings is pretty exciting what's what's happening in the sense you've got an industry that's never been the most innovative pretty slow moving and just in the last 10 years we've we've sort of seen terminology creep up that was foreign in 2000 even 2000 lead uh, energy star uh, boma best these sorts of things and we're seeing the language move all the way up to carbon neutral buildings, to um, regenerative buildings, restorative buildings. And that is just the beginning of a cycle of innovation that I think uh, we're seeing um, some exciting activity happen with. And it's also something, you know, in, in the sense of can money be made with this initiative, we're seeing uh, two Silicon Valley venture capital firms now focus specifically on building materials. We're seeing companies like Cisco and IBM seeing the building sector as one of the fastest growth potential markets for them as far as building in building intelligence and better understanding how to control our buildings. So these are all players jumping into this market that you know are all seeing the opportunity, are all seeing the fact money can be made here. And when we're talking about optimizing buildings, I mean with new developments it's, uh, it's you know relatively straightforward compared to existing buildings. But it's not just about how can I save a few dollars on energy, it's really about how can I optimize the function of that building once you take a look at it. So it needs to be looked at in a completely holistic way. And uh, an example, that, that building on the left hand corner there, that's just an example uh, where it's a building that we've uh, put a proposal for. I just got an email actually about half an hour ago saying they're going to proceed with this project. But uh, this was um, a building where they brought us in to just look at different energy efficiency opportunities. And as we got into it, uh, we also realized that, well, you've got a bunch of, this building was designed 30 years ago with, with different space use ideas than what's currently happening. So you can enclose balconies and reclaim space and do all these sorts of things at much better cost. But also in this building, there's a huge atrium. 
artist that uh, had a nice architectural notion to it, maybe designed in the, you know, one of the low peak uh, cost of oil periods, but just a huge energy, you know, um, consumer. consumer. In fact, the landlord had to subsidize the tenants by about a dollar a square foot just for the feature of this, this uh, atrium. And nobody used it. So our number one energy efficiency measure wasn't, you know, change the lights, change the boilers. It was chop up the atrium, chop it off, score off the building, create some more floor space. You get overall efficiency, uh, better use of the building, and everyone's costs get lower. So it, it, it's about taking a much more comprehensive look than just what you'd think of as the basic energy efficiency measures. And also just how important buildings are as it relates to our transportation infrastructure, our urban fabric, and, and, and how we weave all that together to get the, the lowest footprint um, in that sense. So buildings, they are you know, one of the largest consumers of, of energy and therefore one of the largest opportunities. And uh, especially, you know, we, we've seen the focus on the shiny and new. As, as this dialogue and innovation has moved forward about, about uh, creating greener and better buildings, it's largely been focused on new buildings and uh, seeing, you know, Lee Platinum showcase buildings and these sorts of things. But the reality is, is that you can build every new building you want even to be carbon neutral and it's going to make really zero impact on, on the overall energy consumption because 98, 99% of the uh, building stock that is consuming this is built. Uh, and we're going to see a declining amount of new development and an uh, increased amount of uh, refurbishing of these buildings. So that's the real opportunity, that's where the real focus has to be put in and, and uh, see where, where we can find those opportunities. This is, uh, I'm going to synthesize this a little bit, but uh, I chaired a, uh, a NAFTA committee on green buildings. It was, uh, we were uh, put in place by the um, tripartite government to find different policies and initiatives that can help accelerate uh, the green building marketplace. And this is basically showing what you'll see for anybody that's looking at, at sort of the metrics of energy conservation, which is uh, we, we did a study, we hired Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory out of California, a few other uh, groups out of Mexico and Canada, and we did, uh, first of all, a um, uh, calculation of the total stock of buildings in the different sectors in North America, whether it be single family homes, multi residential, commercial, industrial, you name it put a growth factor to that to sort of uh, be able to figure out how many new buildings would be, be built between now and 2030 and did an archetypical design if you want to call it to say okay we know if, if every new building were built today going forward using processes, technologies um, and materials that we know exist today that pay for themselves not make money if, if looked at sort of in a 10-year life cycle point of view uh, and every new building was built that way and every existing building that's in place was touched, and they will be, every, major, every building will be touched in the next 10, 15, 20 years. So between now and 2030, for those buildings that have not yet been retrofitted, they will be retrofitted. So let's assume we retrofitted those to the highest standards possible, uh, but using known technologies, known processes that we know can make money. And the result of that was the uh, black line that's flat through the middle is the building, the carbon footprint of buildings uh, in 1990. So U.S. didn't adopt the code accord, Canada did and then it didn't, but that was what the target was, was, uh, was the Kyoto Accord. So you can see the, uh, the line, it's hard to sell with these different projectors, but, but call it a, a greenish purple line <laughs> that's, that's sort of going across that black line um, is, is where we would be. Uh, in the sense of 2030 where the building stock could be if we just did everything that we know is in place today and just did the right thing. The line in the middle, for those of you that are familiar with uh, the 2030 uh, American Institute of Architectural Challenge, that was a challenge put out by architects that all buildings be notionally carbon neutral by 2030 with the idea that they're all all the buildings are getting 50 to, you know, 40 to 50 percent more energy efficient, and then the, the energy they do consume comes from a green power source. So it's not necessarily seeing buildings generate as much as they consume. And where the building industry actually is, this is a snapshot of the commercial building industry in, in uh, the U.S. We have the same for every sector in Canada, U.S., and Mexico. Is flying off in the wrong direction. So. Similar, I mean, we were in the uh, uh, coal climate research facility earlier, and there was a similar graph talking about what could you do with savings in residential housing, you know, with a little bit of investment, and you saw huge, uh, you know, huge return on investments, huge opportunities. 
Yet the same story is happening. We're not seeing the, the uh, actual execution of this. And that line that goes up like that is not, you know, this is, this is um, demonstrating carbon emissions, but what carbon emissions really relate to, there's just, you know, one measure is the amount of power plants that need to get built, the amount of um, uh, energy consumed, all those sorts of things to, that, that we're not able to avoid by not just doing the right thing. So the main obstacles to seeing us get there is uh, that were identified through this were the primary one is we've seen lots of innovation happen, lots of increased knowledge happen in design, in uh, execution expertise, in, um, in the know-how to get our buildings to be 40 to 50 percent better, but there's been zero innovation or very little innovation in how we finance this and the financial structures to enable this to happen. And the crux of the problem really comes down to one where the real estate industry is really based on, all, all the funds that flow into the real estate industry is really based on an asset-based valuation. And so if you put a mortgage on your house, it's really, the, the, the value of that house is largely determined by, you know, comparables in, in that area. Whether you've done a whole bunch of things to make that house that much more energy efficient, does nothing to change the value of that necessarily from the point of view of going to the bank and getting a mortgage and doing those sorts of things. And that's true in every sector of, of the real estate industry. So it makes it very challenging. So you end up with uh, business cases for retrofitting or building new green buildings that have premiums to them, have great paybacks, but they're all based on cash flow and, and seeing, being paid back by cash flow and not by increased asset value. And as a result, it becomes a bit of a conundrum because it's not easy to find the money and the resources to do the things that can create uh, such a strong return. And the lack of knowledge is something that we're slowly overcoming, but just the perception of cost and challenge to the reality. And we have more and more case studies in the marketplace now that can further demonstrate you know, to the performance and the opportunity. But nonetheless, you know, this study we did, it's you know, McKinsey, uh, International Plan on Climate Change, you know, you know, there's numerous studies that all say basically the same thing. Huge opportunity to make money, not, not just, you know, reduce carbon footprint, reduce, but make money, and we're going in totally the wrong direction. So this, just quickly, is, is what the same slide looks for Mexico. So one of, one of the things that is a challenge uh, long term for us in Canada and, and the U.S., is we're not really needing to do a whole lot because we don't have, the, our growth is slowed, we technically are kind of overbuilt and there's no real pressure to do this other than, you know, really finding the business case to make some money out of it. Whereas most of the developing world will never, even if they did all the best things they could, will never get to, um, uh, back to zero point, they're seeing uh, resources that, you know, are going to run out faster than they can deal with based on their population growth and these sorts. So they're just absolutely having to be smarter, to moving faster, to getting their built environment to be a much more efficient built environment than, than our own. And that leads to a competitive advantage over time as, as they accelerate those programs and we're sort of left in the dust still not figuring out how to get our you know, uh, efficiencies working as well as they should. But it's also, if we can do that, becomes an export opportunity because that's where those opportunities are. That's where there's a real necessity. And if we can figure it out in our own backyard, we can then export that knowledge, uh, the know-how, and the workforce to do that. And when we say things pay for themselves, uh, this is a graph that was sort of showing uh, what, what things pay for themselves now, what things pay for themselves, assuming, in this case, a price on carbon. So we have a fixation with shiny and new technologies and, and big projects. And so you see here uh, things like solar and wind and lots of renewables. I mean, we should be putting money into those. Those are the future down the road. But we put disproportionately uh, a large amount of money into those things that ultimately need subsidy to work. Whereas if you get down to the left-hand side there, the boring stuff, you know, better insulation, better windows, better heating systems, better, that all pays for itself easily, but we don't see nearly the same kind of incentive or the same kind of societal focus on conservation-oriented uh, elements as we do on new, shiny, big project-type initiatives. So the opportunity is there. We all see the opportunity, and uh, yet it's not happening. Anybody have any ideas what the you know, beyond some things we discussed, what, what are really, from the point of view of identifying, okay, money can be made here to actually executing projects, 
what some of the key challenges are as to why we're not getting there. One of the main obstacles in the sense of, of what we call um, you know, a combination of, of separate operating and cap capital budgets and, and what we call split incentives. And, and that is a factor of, you know, generally the person who holds the operating budget is different than the person that owns the capital budget and they rarely marry together to get to what we call life cycle costing, which is, you know, what's the total cost of ownership and the cheapest way to get there. But even if you get that figured out, what, what is often a problem more so in private sector than in public sector actually is, is the notion of uh, you know, the net lease. And so a lot of commercial buildings are owned by a landlord but they're occupied by tenants who are basically paying a net rental rate and then they pay the utilities separately. The value of that building is generally determined by the net rent and not necessarily by operating costs being high or low. And so if a landlord spends a dollar to save the tenant 50 cents, the tenant gets the direct benefit and the landlord, you know, is just basically investing uh, to, to keep the building current. Now, and, and so that's a key challenge that we call split incentives, which, which there are plenty of, plenty of precedents, lots of work done certainly in, in the approach we take with commercial lending. There's easy ways to get around that, but that becomes a key hurdle in just blocking people even from thinking about it in the first place. Is, you know, why am I going to invest in the building if I can't get anything out of it? Any other ideas of, of some big issues that may be blocking the way here? Mm -hmm. We touched on some of these separate capital and operating budgets. Is is you know it's really about we we gotta we gotta move to a world where everything is evaluated on lowest life cycle cost, and not on uh, you know we, we again our banking system drives us to and there's reasons for it and based on appraisal to build the cheapest possible building we can because that's what we're getting financing against and uh, not need to evaluate any of the operating costs in that initial financing and then we deal with the operating costs later uh, as opposed to really coming up with an equation that again delivers total cost of ownership. Um, the education element hits on a number of fronts. Uh, the, the, the perceived versus actual cost. This is, you know, I, I think for those that are not practitioners, the perception is, you know, premiums of 15, 20 percent to do things that might get your billing to be, you know, 20 to 40 percent more efficient than it currently is versus in reality and, and in pilots that you've seen and in projects that you know we've been involved with, we're seeing more like three to five percent and it pays itself back easily in five to six years and, and if structured properly, everyone can make money off it at the same time because it more than pays back through, through the savings. Uh, the workforce is an issue. So you, you do get to a point where let's say you get some projects and you're ready to execute and, and it is, you know, the, the construction industry has largely been thought of as a manufacturing type industry, sort of blue collar type industry. But it's really, you know, as, as the green building movement is moving forward and as we're seeing more innovation and we're seeing new products and, and those sorts of things, it's becoming more towards the knowledge industry in the sense of really being able to have the know-how to not only install and implement this stuff, but how to operate it in a way that you actually get to benefit from, from these efficiencies. There's tons of stories where you know you, you might have uh, the same is a story of, of two schools for example in, um, in the Juno area that were designed and developed with the same uh, systems and, and uh, relative design and one's operating at a cost $300,000 more a year than the other. And that's all got to do with the know-how on how to properly operate that building and bring the right skills in place to do that. Uh, government coordination. This is again more of a, you know, larger scale thing in the sense that every every municipality, every state, uh, to a certain degree in North America, every country wants to do it differently. Uh, yet we're all trying to get to the same goal. So how can we coordinate those things so there's some consistency? If I'm a, a landlord or a developer that has buildings across different jurisdictions, it gets confusing to be able to do the same thing across different buildings when certain jurisdictions have certain incentives and others don't and, and uh, how, you, how you just make that a, uh, a broad based approach. And one of the bigger things that I always like to highlight which is uh, you know a, a real thorn in, in my side is uh, you know coming from I used to be in the venture capital industry before getting into the development industry is you've got an industry with such potential and with such impact and such scale yeah, it's got the lowest amount of research and development investment of any major industry sector and the construction sector in North America has the lowest R&D expenditure compared to any of our counterparts in the developed world in Europe and Asia and other places. They all spend more money in trying to find ways to, you know, to, to, to bring new products to the market than we do here. So that makes it pretty challenging and that gets you to the risk and uncertainty. Unlike, uh, you know, something where I have my, my 
I don't have it. I have my uh, phone here. That in the last ten years, you know, this thing has gone from being a brick to being more powerful than any computer I could have bought ten years ago. But the difference is, I can design a chip. I can test it out. If it doesn't work, I can throw it out. When I design something for a building and I put it in that building, it's got to last for. 15, 20 years. There's no playing around with that. It's not as uh, disposable. So we have to do a lot more uh, research and testing before we implement these things in the field to have, you know, the certainty for owners to want to invest in this, despite how great the business case might might look. So understanding some of these things, I wanted to get your help in uh, walking through a bit of a uh, an example. That uh, this is a project we're actually executing on. Uh, it's in Toronto, Canada. And our approach for building optimization uh, in the in existing building world is that we fundamentally don't believe that the average owner feels they can make money. You know, they feel they need to update their buildings to remain current, to keep their tenants, to do other things. But it's really just about you know trying to stay relevant and not looking inwards and sort of saying you know we know we by buying a new building we know how to do the business case to make money, but we don't believe that there's really money to be made by you know mining our own building stock basically. So we take an approach with owners where we say, why don't you tell us what it would take in pure financial terms to invest in your building? And if we can come back and show you a business case that delivers that kind of return, you got to move forward with the project. And if we do move forward with the project, and if you don't move forward with the project, then there's some pre-agreed costs. But at least uh, has us, it's having us taste the risk and having us take the onus, but we're strong believers that we can come back and show a uh, positive business case to, to this owner. So in this case, this building is a uh, 1960s building, 21-story uh, building downtown Toronto, uh, single-pane windows. Toronto is quite a bit south, but still gets quite extreme winters and quite extreme summers. So uh, with single-pane windows, it has quite an impact on, uh, on the thermal performance and comfort in the building. Uh, it's got original mechanical electrical systems. It's um, uh, you know it's, it's it's pretty dated in in how it operates. Yet it's uh, a Boma. Is everyone anyone familiar with the Boma Best rating system? So Boma Best Boma is Buildings Owners and Managers Association. It's a North American uh, wide uh, industry. Most people have everyone has everyone in the room heard of LEED before, more or less. So LEED is kind of the gold standard, if you want to call it, in the sense of uh, you know sort of putting a label on something and saying that it's truly green or sustainable. Uh, the Building Owners and Managers Association wanted something that was a little simpler. That just said we're operating our building properly, we're creating better energy performance, and uh, we're we're moving. Uh, you know we, we have uh, reduced energy use. So you can get a Boma Best one, two, three, and four, with four being the best that you can get. This was a Boma Best three, which meant on the street it was deemed to be quite a well-operated building, quite an energy-efficient building. So that meant we had to figure out creatively different ways that we could take this thing and um, get to uh, a 9% IRR. Now, the financial world really is looking at things with different terms. You have return on investment, which is basically if I put a dollar in, how much money am I going to get out? And then I'm going to divide that by the number of years that uh, the project's going to you know, run, and that's going to give me my annual rate of return. And then most companies use what's called internal rate of return, which is basically an opportunity cost analysis to say that, you know, in this case, if it's 9%, they're saying uh, the IR has to be 9%, so my internal annual rate of return has to be 9%, because if it's less than that, I got places I can stick that money that I can do a better return. And it's really all about financial decision to move things forward. And so we had to surprise these guys and show them that they could. On this building itself, they only currently earn about an 8% IRR, so they were looking for an IRR higher than what they get just currently operating the building. So what do you think we do? Where, where do we start to take this to a point that we can bring a positive business case to them? Any ideas? What's that? <laughs> so windows and mechanical. That's, so we throw it out there. But how do, how do we evaluate that? How do, how do we know, first of all, whether, you know, what, what it is that, that can create a return on investment out of that? How much are you spending? How much are you spending? So what's your baseline? So we have to, first of all, determine uh, what it is we're measuring against. And what we're measuring against has to be looked at in two ways. One is not only our current uh, utility spend, on the building, because really what we're trying to do is bring that down and take those savings to pay for capital. Uh, but also, 
you know, what happens a lot and, and, you know, makes it challenging to create positive business cases is someone might say, okay, well, I got to change the boiler because the boiler is 30 years old uh, and I'm going to save, you know, $10,000 a year changing the boiler and you're trying to make the business case uh, for that 100% cost of the boiler off, you know, the energy savings of that, which isn't really a fair comparison because you have to change that boiler anyways. There has to be an acceptance if you own a building or you run a building, there's just inherent costs to operating and you need to understand what your baseline costs are that you're going to spend anyways, ideally for sort of a 10 year period so that what you're measuring against is really the premium. So let's say that boiler, you know, that boiler might be $100,000 but I choose to, for a typical boiler and I choose to get a 95% efficiency boiler and that's $125,000. I'm trying to just rationalize that $25,000. I'm not trying to rationalize the $125,000. So we've got to know how to set it up, what we're baselining against and what we're trying to create a business case against. So we get that together and uh, that gets you to the equivalent, let's say, of an energy audit of the building. and. Where do we go from there? And this is often where people get stuck. You know, you get an energy audit, it's got a list of 15 different energy conservation measures that you could pursue. And uh, what do you do with that? Any ideas? We invite a few more people to the party. That's, uh, that's exactly right. I mean, if we're going to really do this properly, you want to get a team that not only involves the energy audit, but you want to get, um, you know, mechanical electrical design skill at the table, you want to get uh, envelope science skill at the table, uh, you want to get um, uh, someone who understands clearly how to put together a financial model at the table, which is often one of the key missing pieces. Uh, often you might want to get an architect at the table, you know, to look at different things if it's, if it's going beyond just doing basic lighting and, and boilers and those sorts of things. So you need to put together, you know, just like if you were to design a new building, and this is often, you know, again, where things don't sort of go as well as they could. When you design a new building, you put your whole team together. You set clear targets for what it is that you're, you're trying to get to, whether they be sustainable targets or just cost targets, whatever, and everybody's got to kind of work towards that. Some are more successful than others as far as being integrated versus sort of in silos. But, um, and you have to do, when you're looking at a retrofit, we don't treat it the same way. We run around and we do things very piecemeal. We say, this year, oh, we're going to change the lights. Next year, we'll change a few fans in the, in the boiler, in the, in the um, rear F units, all those sorts of things. And we never really know where we're going. And we never really have an outcome of, of where that building is, is. And what happens with that is you get maybe 15, 20% better when we miss the opportunity to get 40% better and, and really, you know, make capital, uh, substantial capital improvements that can make substantial money through the process. So just to, so we, we determine the baseline. So in this case, the baseline that we set was really a pure financial baseline. Well, well I shouldn't say that. We set, we set targets first. <laughs> if the target was a financial target, we determine the baseline. Uh, we uh, get our team together. We look at an integrated design. Uh, and then we really get that nut that we're trying to rationalize after we've refined through all the process and figure out what it is that you know, we think is the best program for the building. Uh, we examine ideally beyond just energy efficiency but again look at space optimization and usage of the building based on how it's being used today compared to how it might have been designed 30 years ago whenever it was put in place to get the best uh, function out of that. Uh, and then we, uh, you know, we, what's missing out of that I guess is we figure out how to finance it. Which, uh, which I'll speak to uh, a little later. We execute that plan uh, and then we measure and verify and we appreciate this as just a starting point. And once, you know, the great thing about once you get this knowledge together about the building is, first of all, the level of operational capacity in itself should have just stepped up because now we have a much, we're like starting fresh again with the building and really understanding what we're dealing with. Uh, and then we're just from there continuously optimizing and it's, it's a starting point and moving it forward uh, as much as we can. So some of this language we've touched on already but, but the business case really to translate it from an energy audit to a business case that can be financed through some vehicle really is having to turn all that data, all those detailed engineering reports, all those different processes into a return on investment analysis. And often what happens too with, with an energy audit just in a simple form is you might get 15 things on a list but ultimately what you're trying to do is execute you know a, a package of things so you need to assemble those things and try and put them into a full business case and that business case may be one where you might be executing projects over 
10 years versus doing it all at once. But at least you know where you're headed. You know, once everything's done, what kind of return on investments you're going to get. You can put in that present value, which is, which is sort of today's cost for doing things down the road, and, and really create a clear business case for these things. And that is something that then you can speak to internal finance, external finance, and say, here's, you know, here's the opportunity. Um, some of the things we didn't touch on, uh, energy conservation, but ESCOs, so, you know, ESCOs is um, uh, something, you know, a, a service in the marketplace that basically is able to come and guarantee, you know, so they're looking to de-risk for the owner this whole process of, of uh, you know, who's taking what risk and who's uh, having to understand things and basically suggesting that we will um, perform the services guarantee the cost, guarantee the savings, and as an owner, you just have to, you know, um, bring them on board and, and, and let them operate. Oftentimes, um, the owner is missing out on a lot of opportunity by bringing an ESCO on board. So, and that's just, again, about just getting the right knowledge in the marketplace and, and different ways of doing things. Commissioning is really about uh, verifying everything's working the way it, it should work at the end of the day and constantly sort of tweaking that and measurement and verification uh, being, again, once it's operating, you don't stop. You can continue going and continue and trying to find the opportunities. What happens, though, because of the financial hurdles is, uh, and the split incentives and all these things we highlighted at the top level, it sort of seems to be the barrier between this huge opportunity to make money and actually executing, is uh, generally energy efficiency projects get approved that are only you know, two to three year payback at most. Uh, again, because they're not being looked at as investments, they're being looked at necessary costs in the building to just, you know, sort of keep it going and might as well try and do things a little bit better. So it leaves a huge bucket of money on the table that's, that's not being uh, taken advantage of. And if you look at energy efficiency compared to any other long-term investments you might consider safe, I, mean, I don't think any of us necessarily would say, I'm going to go invest in energy efficiency versus the stock market or versus a T-bill. But really, if you look at it that way, it's one of your highest risk return investments you can, you can find out there. And it's only going to get better because utilities are going to do nothing but go up. Again, you know, one of the key things that we've got to focus on is, is really try and, and start with the passive things, conservation-oriented things. Often we start with, hey, let's look at putting solar on our roof, let's look at doing other things. Uh, and it's not that those things aren't good things to look at, but they're the hardest things to rationalize. If you start with the passive things, uh, there's a lot uh, easier way to get there. Focusing on more of an integrated design process up front, spending more time at the beginning uh, will reap rewards for you down the road versus, uh, you know, and, and this is where you're trying to integrate all the pieces, understanding how, you know, in, in very simple terms, if I'm going to look at a building and change, the lighting to greatly reduce the heat load and lighting and we yeah, improve the roof and the envelope. Well, then my HVAC system should get much smaller and all these types of things that now let you truly optimize the systems versus what often happens is everything just happens in a silo and, and you miss those efficiencies and those opportunities. And in doing that, if this is a study that was done on about 144 commercial buildings that were retrofitted and done in a way that was done in a true holistic sort of deep green approach. Um, when we do these, these piecemeal things where we change the lights and we get two-year payback and we change a few fans and we do all these sorts of things, what happens is that when the major capital costs come up, like a new boiler or replacement of windows, there's nothing to pay for that anymore. Uh, but if we can aggregate that all into one business plan, just like any invest, investment manager might advise to invest in a portfolio of things in the marketplace, uh, we got to invest in our portfolio of things in the building that gives us an aggregate return. And plenty of case studies have shown that if you take the processes we're talking about, you push for 40% plus target as far as improvement in the building. You don't worry about necessarily the amount of capital so long as you can deliver the return because it's about trying to tunnel through that cost barrier. You should be able to find 10 to 20% IRR in those building retrofits uh, in, um, in, in sort of an aggregate way. And that's about sort of really looking at, at tunneling to the cost barrier. So, you know, you, you get compounding savings. If you just change the lights, it's one thing. You make that expenditure cost more, save a bit of money. The more you compound all these things, the greater uh, savings you'll see, and, and all of a sudden you find you make, you make a breakthrough, and, and um, you might find that although you've spent more money, the business case is that much more stronger at, at the end of the day. 
And this is just one quick example of uh, one of our projects in Canada. This is a lead platinum multi-residential building that um, the one slight thing our architect did as a starting point, and this is part of spending more time up front, is just twisted the building 45 degrees so that the face was uh, facing southwest as opposed to a typical rectangular block. So that strip up the front is a passive solar um, heat, passive solar wall. And on as a line item, it was going to cost about $300,000 more and never pay for itself. But as we looked at an integrated uh, approach with our architects and with others, the cost of those materials were less than the finishing materials we had on the building in the first place. And as we subtract and add and do all those sorts of things, it was actually a cheaper solution than if we just built the building in a standard way and we got 5% free heat out of, the, uh, out of the process. So this building, uh, you know, I touched on the different systems that were there. Uh, to give you an idea from, uh, in this case, lead performance requirements, um, the equivalent kilowatt hours per square foot is really just bringing a universal uh, metric to the amount of gas and electricity used. But it was about 38 and a half equivalent kilowatt hours per square foot. It needed to get to 25 and a half just to pre-qualify for, for lead existing buildings in this case. It's a bit of a dog. Energy Star is, is sort of rating buildings against their peers and within their geography. Uh, one being the worst, 100 being the best. So this was failing, basically uh, against its peers, and needed to get close to 70% to at least pre-qualify. Lighting, this happens a lot. Uh, they had gone in, they'd retrofit all the lights, but they'd just gone in and replaced each fixture light by light with a more efficient and, and you know, more lumen, uh, uh, brighter light, so that it was too bright, in fact. And the tenants were complaining by too much light being in there and it was overlit. Uh, water didn't meet any of the requirements, indoor air quality didn't meet any requirements. So even though it was a good operating building, it had a lot of challenges to get it to the point that it, uh, it could get over that threshold. So the net result of all that though is, is um, you know, we ended up creating five different scenarios where the first one was the simple one, and this would be sort of a typical ESCO type uh, scenario where it was just tweaking the mechanical system, optimizing the lighting, doing a few other things. It was about a $3 million project and was going to deliver to the owner a 16, 17% IRR, which uh, they were quite surprised and happy about. Um, but the problem with that solution, which is often the case when you look at these things, especially with older buildings, it was really just putting a Band-Aid on stuff. You know, it was making what, what's there work better, but it was still deferring the fact that at some point in time, the building needs a renewal. And how do you justify that renewal? The other problem is that didn't deal with changing the window. Surprisingly, on a commercial structure of that nature, where a lot of the heating and cooling happens, you know, sort of in the core and the transfers around, it only had about a 5% factor on energy, whether you put on better windows or not. It, it had a, about a 60 to 70% factor as far as occupant comfort goes, but you can't put money to that. So it was, uh, it was again, trying to t rationalize it with, with just the tangible side of things. So then we said, well, let's do what we were doing in one, and we'll change the windows. So we'll go to option two, and it didn't quite work. Um, the second option down below, uh, just to give you an idea again, and looking at things really holistically, was an option we added on in the sense that this building was built. It was recessed in from the street. Uh, it's now um, on a street that commands about $300 a square foot retail rent. So if we're changing windows anyways, if we just took the windows on the retail level, at which are currently inset on the inside of the columns, and move them to the outside of the columns, that's $300 a square foot of new revenue you know, in that space for just a very simple move like that. So again, I was really looking at all the different ways to, to optimize. So that was sort of an option uh, around each one. So then we kept tunneling. We kept trying to go deeper and deeper. And so what happens if we just ripped out the whole mechanical system that's there right now and put in a brand new system? Obviously, it's going to save a lot more energy. You can see the energy factor, you know, we go from 384,000 to 461,000 in, in savings. But it's still a major capital expenditure that doesn't get rationalized just by, you know, another 70 or, or $80,000 in, in saved energy. But what it did do is it took uh, an old mechanical system that took up two penthouse floors. Uh, a new one would take up half a floor. So it created a whole floor and a half of new revenue opportunity. Uh, and in this case, downtown Toronto, penthouse floor, worth a fair bit. So we modeled that out in turning that into new office space and new uh, revenue opportunity. So that didn't quite get us there either, though. We were still at only 7.5%. So then we looked at different options. You know, for example, what if we turn that into condos? And every building is different, right, and as far as how you can optimize it, how you look at it, what the metrics are. But just an idea of 
really you know what needs to be looked at to, to get the whole program through and that you know was it was an absolute home run and where we've ended up and what has been approved is uh, the fifth option which which had us work harder at option three uh, as well as to replace the windows we skin the building basically create a brand new building uh, with new office space on, on the top and the owner seeing uh, a 12 percent annual return on their investment much bigger project much higher return than they're currently seeing out of the project and this model does not forecast in any way an increase in rent uh, any inflationary factors and utilities so it's nothing but uh, I mean, when we gave this to the pension fund that owns this building they tore the model apart and they came back and said well actually our returns are higher than yours which is what we'd like to hear um, but it was really the only way we made this project happen and moved it from A to B is we took we, we took all the risk uh, and all the packaging to take all the various different engineering reports and distill it to this. This was essentially, you know, the report we gave them, and then we're taking an approach where we're guaranteeing the cost and we're guaranteeing the savings. So we're really uh, de-risking that for for the owner. And how all this equation works obviously takes a fair bit of time to go through. But just to give you an idea of, of how you can uh, you can can work through these things. And in this case, financing is always a challenge. So we always. Um, need to approach owners and, and there needs to be vehicles out there where we'll say if you don't want to do it we'll finance it ourselves. But there hasn't been a project we've done yet now and we're largely dealing with pension funds and other larger institutions at this point. Once we've got it down to a distilled business case like this, they're sitting on money needing to figure out places to put it. And if they can see the right returns, every one of them said once we got to this point, you know what, we'll finance it ourselves. Thanks. And uh, so again a lot of the hurdle is just getting it to a tight business case that, that can sell itself. So the opportunity, you know, again, just to reiterate, it's large. Um, this is from the Rocky Mountain Institute uh, that, that, you know, is, is again, just further reiterating things we hear about all the time, which is very little money, can make very high returns. Uh, it can defer, from a societal point of view, lots of capital costs and other types of projects and new um, uh, power generation plants, those sorts of things, create new jobs, create new skills. Um, much greater um, uh, lower impact on our health care by creating healthier indoor environments where we spend 90 percent of our time so it's it's frustrating you know to see such an opportunity and yet not necessarily seeing seeing the same you know the focus that we'd like on it uh, but they, these are real challenges in the middle that have to work them themselves out before we get there so some of the examples uh, locally here that uh, we're seeing some positive results and, and uh, are, are going to help accelerate that are, you know, like we heard about early, the uh, revolving loan fund, which James, I don't know if you want to talk about any further. Okay. Uh, most of you in here are kind of familiar with this program. I just want to take a minute um, to kind of tie these two together. Obviously, we've just gone through how you evaluate um, buildings and investments and with our loan fund we're kind of at that point now where we have a lot of public facilities that have these investment grade audits and now they're at that point of how do we move forward with the project is there financing out there our revol revolving loan fund was set up and designed so that we HFC would be able to write that loan for that um, scope of work based on the energy savings is going to pay for the loan and once the loan is paid off in five ten years all that energy savings becomes additional revenue to the building um, all the information or a lot of the information is on this brochure that's just available at the at the table i'm not going to say much more about that uh, it's just based on kind of the business case and um, can I go to the next slide yep the next slide just kind of highlights uh alaska energy authority had a the last two years a program for non-public facilities and privately owned buildings where they were actually offering the free investment grade audits um, to a commercial or privately owned or non-profit owned building. Um, so there are buildings out there that have these audits, but again, they're kind of sitting there with no path to go forward unless they can self-finance um, the project at this point. So just kind of a couple options that are in the works, but not necessarily the whole picture as of yet. And, and just Quickly, you know, before I go, because I want to have some time for questions. But you know, here's some bills that have been passed in Alaska, which are great initiatives. You know, for example, energy efficiency of 15% by 2020. But the irony of this is, 15% energy efficiency, 50% renewables, and you know, you're looking at 50% that need to have uh, a lot of subsidy to get there, and 15% that technically should be making money. Imagine if you did 50 and 50. 
And if you're able to achieve that, then now all of a sudden you're really winning. And so why again are we putting more focus on renewables than we are on efficiency when the business case for efficiency seems to be much clearer? Um, further builds in, you know, anything's a step forward though, so it's not trying to be critical, it's just trying to say are we moving the bar uh, forward fast enough and are we really setting the right goals to, to what we're trying to achieve. And you're also seeing, you know, school boards and um, various economic development agencies putting various policies in place. So these are all good movements, but it's a question of 10 to 20 percent is not good enough. 40 to 50 percent is easily attainable, can be done, and it can make money. So why aren't we doing this? And that's how I'll end. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you.